So I'm going to be up front this morning and simply state to you that I am not a fisherman. <laughs> Are there any fishermen here, any people who love fishing? So maybe you ought to be coming up here and talking about this text. Because I can count maybe on, one, maybe on two hands uh, how many times I've gone fishing. I did try at one point fly fishing. It seemed kind of cool, but I didn't have the skill or grace uh, in which to, to accomplish uh, fly fishing. So I can, like I say, count on two hands the times I've been fishing, and I must tell you that in my lifetime I have no memory of this, but I don't think I have ever caught a fish. <laughs> I have been denied that experience um, and so I must say that the story we read this morning, this story of uh, Jesus' uh, call to Peter, uh, is one that I, I kind of have difficulty connecting to and relating to, in part because of my life experience. And I, I share that not to garner sympathy for you or, or ridicule or anything like that, but the reality that in some ways I'm, I'm, I struggle with this text this commandment uh, to be fisher of people. Uh, and I struggle to understand what exactly that might mean. Um, part of the genius of Jesus, part of his amazing ways of connecting to the people of his time, was this ability to use everyday things to communicate about the grace of God. Uh, about farming or... Uh, stories about lost sheep or wayward sons. Uh, this ability to kind of uh, take these grand ideas about God and connect it to their everyday life. And unfortunately, the city boy has often a lot of trouble with trying to understand uh, some of these ideas uh, that connected to Jesus' time. I, I very rarely planted anything in my life, to be honest. And I, um, I've never really... Um, been uh, that much of a wayward son, and to be truth, I hate the idea of being considered sheep. So I, I find sometimes some of these stories, some of the ways in which he relates his ideas about the kingdom of God, I struggle with how to understand how that might connect to our lives. And uh, this is a text many of us have heard, and this uh, kind of call of Peter to become fishers of people and most of us probably have heard that. And in most contexts, many of us, when we hear that story, tend to think, well, Jesus is talking about evangelism, right? That's what Jesus is talking about. Um, now, I know in Presbyterian circles, evangelism can sometimes be a little dirty word. Uh, but the truth is that when we read this story in that lens, it's interesting what we think evangelism is because what we tend to do is we tend to think of evangelism really is kind of recruiting right recruiting to get people into heaven or recruiting more often than not to get people in church uh, and so what we often think of, of evangelism is just a form of recruitment and so uh, what you'll see often talked about in evangelism circles is what's the next social media tool that I can use to get people to recruit people or uh, what's the next uh, program I can put on that would recruit people or, or what are the kinds of things I can do to land the fish out there and keep them in the boat, right? But if you think about it, that's rather an odd idea about what evangelism is. And that's an odd idea, in a sense, to say that's our task, is to, to fish for people. I'm not sure people would like to be considered fish. I don't like to be considered a fish. So what is Jesus really getting at in this example? And, and there's some subtle things in this story that indicate it's far different than maybe how we might traditionally hear it. Um, maybe something far more profound is going on. And so the story starts. Uh, there's a great crowd interested in hearing Jesus, and he steps on these boats. 
these fishing boats, and he teaches and preaches from there. And then he tells Peter, Simon, Peter, who will be Peter, he tells him, go out into that deep water and cast your nets, right? And so Peter says, you know, Peter kind of says, hey, we worked all night. You know, we tried. We didn't catch a thing. But, hey, it's you. We'll try it. We'll, we'll, we'll go do it. So they go out. He goes out to the deeper shore. He throws out the nets, and they get so filled. What's interesting about this story is they get so filled, he needs help hauling the nets in. They call some of his colleagues, co-workers, and they, they kind of start pulling in these nets so full of fish that, it, that it's so full that as they're pulling them in, and there's this interesting line, it, it gets so full that the boat is about to sink. And then Peter, this is a line I didn't understand in the story. Peter turns to Jesus and he says, Jesus, what does he say exactly? He says, I, I need to leave. I need to go. He says, go away from me, Jesus, because I'm a sinful man. That, to me, is the oddest response to this miracle he's just experienced. And I don't quite understand it. So to me, I think the key in exploring this passage, exploring this text, is the truth is that this story is about the full nets, so full they can't pull them into the boats, that this story is really about abundance. That Christ creates abundance. So much abundance is beyond imagination. So much abundance that in essence that Jesus is preaching and Jesus is embodying in a way this abundance of grace. This idea that God provides all these fish. Nets full to breaking, a, a boat about to be overturned, that God gives grace. Because the truth be told, any story Jesus tells over and over again is always about that abundance. And to me, the reason why Peter says, leave me, Jesus, for I am a sinful man, an odd response to this abundance that exists of grace, of God's love, is the truth is, I think he doesn't think he deserves the abundance, right? I'm a sinful man. I don't deserve this gift of abundance. I don't deserve what you've done. I didn't earn it. I worked all night. I didn't get anything. I didn't do what was right or say the right words. I didn't get and don't deserve that abundance. Think about that. Think about that. I don't deserve your love that's so abundant it conquers everything I might put in the way, any way I might try to alienate myself from you. I don't deserve... The reality that your love is so all-encompassing, that embraces us is so unearned and unmerited, I can't comprehend that that's how you work in the world, and therefore I don't deserve it. Is the truth be told, we live in a world more focused on scarcity than it is about abundance, don't we? A world so focused on not seeing the abundance out there that we only focus on what's missing well in our national discourse you see it all the time we are more concerned about 
not abundance, but the resources are scarce, and so I've got to get mine, and I've got to build a wall or protect someone else from getting mine, right? Because there's not an abundance out there. There's just a little bit, I've got to get my piece of pie, and God help you if you try to reach and get my piece of pie. Isn't that how we look at the world? That's our worldview is not about abundance, but about scarcity in the church. We do it all the time. We're focused on what we're missing, don't we? We never have enough, enough people, enough uh, money, enough, enough. Because we view the world in terms of scarcity. We focus on what's missing. Rather than on these full nets of God's grace, so much so that if we hauled in all, the, all those fish, and it, again, what's interesting about the net thrown out is it doesn't care what kind of fish it gets. <laughs> it doesn't care about what the fish look like. It's just welcoming, and that God is bringing all these fish, so much so that it might, might disturb the boat and sink it. How often do we as a church think in terms of scarcity than in the abundance that God provides all the time. How often do we in our own personal discipleship, in our own personal lives, focus so much on what's missing, on what's scarce, then truly embrace the abundance that God provides to us all the time. And part of the reason I think we do that is because we don't think we deserve it, right? We don't deserve the grace. Well, that's true. But God gives it to us anyway. Over and over and over again. But leave me, Lord, I'm too sinful. I don't deserve this. The root word for evangelism, it kind of comes from a Hebrew concept that uh, uh, a messenger would be sent uh, to return to Jerusalem um, to share the good news that victory had been achieved in war. They would come and announce the army is returning to Jerusalem and we want to share the good news, the king has victory. So the very root word of evangelism isn't recruitment or isn't isn't this idea of getting people to fish them out of the ocean and bring it's sharing the good news God's love is victorious now I know these days it's hard to believe it's sharing the good news of joy of the reality that God's love is so big and so abundant and so present that it will overcome anything. That's what it means to share good news. To be caught up in the joy of God, of Jesus Christ, so caught up that you want to share it. That joy with your family, your friends, with your children, with your parents, you want to share that joy with the people around you. And that's our task. We are called to evangelism. To share the good news of God's love that is so abundant it overcomes any barrier or boundary we place between us. We're caught up in joy, offering joy to those around us. This we do in Christ's name. Amen.